All right, hello everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly JavaScript News Podcast, episode thirty-nine. And oh boy, do we have some stuff to talk about today. There's some articles and news, but I think the primary topic will be event stream incidents and everything related to it. I even had to create a separate section for it because there's just too many related things. Uh, we also got some major releases and some uh, major announcements, which is also pretty cool, and a bunch of you know libraries and demos and some interesting stuff uh, specifically from Amazon, which is not directly JavaScript related, but I thought it was pretty cool, so we'll, we're gonna talk about that as well. But uh, let's get started with the article and news. The first one we got here is the Article from the Dev2, which is called How to Create Pure CSS Illustrations and Animate Them. This is actually a three part article that talks about CSS animations pretty in depth, starting from the very basic ones in the first article and going into more advanced techniques um, in part two and part three. So if you are interested in CSS animations, which I would recommend investigating because there's basically nothing works better than CSS animations in the browser. JavaScript will never be able to produce as smooth of, uh, you know, kind of animations as the CSS does. I would definitely recommend um, looking through the article because it will get you started quite nicely with uh, pretty complex things actually. So if you're curious do check it out. Next article we got here is Easy peasy global state in React with hooks. We got more React state management solutions using hooks. And uh, this one is literally called easy peasy. So um, yeah, it's essentially an introduction to the library called easy peasy that um, I think there's just a GIF, yes, uh, that basically uh, allows you to manage states in a pretty straightforward way. So yes, the library is literally called easy peasy. And uh, it is actually quite complex. So you basically create store and you use the store provider as in the context provider to pass the store down the tree. So this is pretty common pattern right now with the state management solutions. Then you can use uh, hooks like use store and use action that actually do um, kind of tricky things that uh, you would likely see in Redux than anything else. So it's, you know, it has a, um, how do I put it? It has enough depth to make it um, stand out essentially, let's put it this way, right? And the cool thing is also, um, if I remember correctly, yes, it actually works with the Redux DevTools if you enable the DevTools integration, which is kind of awesome. So you, you get like the full, you know, time travel and actions repeating and everything um, just by toggling a flag on it. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Seems to be quite nice library. Next article we got here is WebAssembly doesn't make unsafe languages safe yet uh, in uh, brackets. And it talks about WebAssembly and a WebAssembly, specifically WebAssembly memory model, right? So WebAssembly is supposed to be super safe because wait, we're running a very low level code right in our browser, right? So you don't really wanna run anything that might uh, compromise host in it. Uh, and the thing is that actually WebAssembly currently does achieve that. So if you take an unsafe language like for example C and compile it to WebAssembly, it uh, immediately becomes safer as the author notes, but uh, safer here is in quotes because um, while it is safer for the host system, as in, you know, it cannot really escape from the browser and Google and Firefox and you know other guys, they are making a lot of effort to make sure that the WebAssembly code cannot actually escape from the browser. There are still problems uh, of how it works internally and how it actually, um, how the memory allocation works between the uh, different WebAssembly scripts running inside of the VM. So if you are interested in WebAssembly, do have a look at this read through. There's some very interesting insights, uh, I never thought about that, but again, you know, I'm not exactly a WebAssembly guy, but it was quite curious to read about that. So if the whole WebAssembly um, area is curious for you and uh, you know, if you are watching the area, then do check it out. There are some pretty interesting thoughts and pointers of how exactly the memory allocation works, what are the null pointers uh, shortcomings and what is the, what's going on essentially with the host versus guest safety and what can be done to fix that? Uh, for example, you know, um, allocating and garbage collecting stuff. So garbage collection is something that is already coming to WebAssembly quite soon. All right, 
Next thing we got here is really, really cool. This is an NCC Node.js compiler collection from the tight guys. Um, it is essentially uh, something like, you can think about it, something like Webpack, but for Node apps, right? So, or as they sell it is essentially native compiler tool chains such as Go, but for Node.js. The idea is that you can install NCC and then use it to bundle your app or either run or bundle into one script, right? So you will get one script that bundles all the dependencies together and then you can just run node script.js and it will work without any NPM install or anything like this. Um, not only does this reduces the amount of uh, size, you know, with regards to node modules, for example, so if you take like the app that has Apollo Server Express and GraphQL, the node modules are 35 megs. But if you use NCC on it, it's going to be just a you know few kilobytes essentially, right? Just they claim 35 times size of the bundle. So it's actually going to be, okay, 950 kilobytes. So that's like 35 times size reduction, which is insane. But it's not only about the size because um, NCC also offers a bunch of optimizations and faster boot up and a bunch of other related um, improvements essentially, uh, which is really cool. They do have a lot of future work um, plans, like for example, caching, built-in minification, source maps for debugging, automatic dependency installation and uh, TypeScript support and V8 compiler cache support and native add-ons and a whole bunch of other things planned. But this thing looks incredible. Like I think that um, I probably would use it in majority of my projects before deployment because it's straight up gonna save space and gonna save time, especially the startup, which is kind of great. You know, you, you essentially don't, you don't have to the node no longer has to go through all the files and as in, you know, when you resolve require, you no longer have to follow the, resolve the file and then read it and then include it and then parse it. You already have everything in one file, which is gonna save a lot of time in my opinion. So yeah, this is kind of great and I'm pretty excited to see where all of this goes. All right, next article we got here is transducers, efficient data processing pipelines in JavaScript. This is very functional programming heavy article. And yeah, as you might've guessed from title, it talks about transducers. Uh, in case you didn't know, transducers are highly composable, uh, sorry, composable higher order reducer that takes a reducer's input and re uh, returns another reducer. So um, for example, the compose function is an example of a transducer, right? So this article is essentially an introduction to transducers. It first of all explains what is going on, right? So what are transducers and how do they work? And then goes into why are we going to use them? Where do we need them? And how you can actually apply them in the um, real life, let's put it. As, along with some background and etymology and all the related theory, which is there a lot because it's a functional programming. Uh, Donna, thank you very much for your cheer. This is awesome as usual. Okay, um, yeah, so if you are interested in functional programming, uh, specifically applied to uh, JavaScript, do check out this article about transducers. It will give you everything you gotta know about um, them, basically. All right, next thing we got here is the principle of list astonishment and JavaScript sorts. This is a pretty deep dive into how sort works in JavaScript, right? It is, uh, as in, you know, the sort function is um, pretty straightforward when you pass an argument to it, right? So when you know that your array, for example, is numbers, then you can pass a sort that will sort it by numbers and then everything works as expected. But if you call sort without passing everything, there is some weirdness to it. Let's just put it this way, right? The thing is that this weirdness is actually documented. That's, that's also like one of the points. This article basically deep dives into the whole thing and tries to figure out how exactly it works and what exactly happens. There are some things in the article that are not 100% uh, correct. Uh, and there is an ongoing discussion in the replies to the article. For example, there's the Matthias uh, Binance one of the V8 engineers, uh, I think I've posted his news quite regularly, who talks about some specifics of how the GS engine uh, handles the arrays and element kinds and all stuff like this. So it's quite, quite interesting. Um, so if you're curious about how the 
JavaScript sort works, do check it out. It's really cool. Um, Donna, once again, thank you very much for cheering. This is really cool. Okay, continuing, we got, um, yeah, this one is really cool. So this is um, article called how we reduced our initial JavaScript and CSS size by 67%. And it's essentially a case study that shows on how to practically optimize your website to reduce the size of the immediately loaded things, right? So they have the, even the project is open source. We can actually go have a look at the project itself, but essentially, it talks about using Webpack bundle analyzer to figure out what kind of uh, libraries and uh, things eat up the space, right? So it might be like CSS and uh, SVG or whatever you uh, require. It talks about the long-term caching uh, with content hashes. So when your resource changes, actually the caching validates. The commons bundle, code splitting on a route level, which is extremely easy to do now with the new React suspense. Loading external dependencies on demand, which is actually a pretty neat um, bit of it. And I mean, I'm, I'm gonna show it to you in a second. Talking about font awesome and tree shaking, which I actually didn't know was possible. And switching from big to smaller NPM packages, which is something that you should consider if your bundle is too big, as well as optimizing the main bundle and using TSLib if you are relying on TypeScript. So um, specific highlights, that I want to um, uh, specific things that I want to highlight are, first of all, um, loading external dependencies on demand, which is really cool. So they're talking about here uh, about the um, little, uh, what is it called to toasts, right? So toast notifications. And they, they included the library that is 30 kilobytes of size, and that only 5% of users ever used, right? So this is kind of a waste. Um, hey man, welcome to the stream. Um, once again, hell if I remember how to read your username, so I'm just gonna skip it. <laughs> I know that it is you, Leonid, and I'm not gonna read your username. Okay, uh, but coming back to the article. Um, so we got 30 kilobytes of JavaScript that is rarely used, right? So what they did is they switched to dynamic import and after importing it, they call the module, which is basically gonna load those 30 kilobytes only when they need it and display you this nice toast whenever, you know, something happens essentially. By the way, having 30 kilobytes for just displaying toast seems a bit weird, but we'll just roll with it. The other cool thing is that font awesome and tree shaking approach, um, the idea that, you know, the font awesome is actually just a font, right? Uh, but there's actually the React icons NPM package that is really cool and uses SVG format, right? So they actually you can import only specific icons and specific bits of it, which means the tree shaking will work. And in their case, they had a 68 kilobyte smaller bundle because of that, which is really cool. By the way, React icons are an amazing library and I wholeheartedly recommend using them. So yeah, if you're interested in all those kind of details, then do check out this uh, use case essentially, it is really nicely written up and there's a lot of uh, pretty cool things going on here and a lot of very interesting, let me try that again, a lot of very interesting pointers. All right, next article we got here is a different way to manage state in React. Um, introduction to a new library called React Recollect, which uh, uses the higher order component and a global store to allow for interesting looking patterns, let's just put it this way. So you wrap your components in the collect um, higher order function, or I guess higher order component in this case, and then you can use the global store in your component as if it just was there. So the recollect will handle the updates and all this kind of stuff for you. I am not sure what is it based off because I don't think the article ever talks about it unless I somehow missed it while reading but I'm guessing it's probably something like ES6 proxies again. Uh, yes, it is a proxies. Okay, so I just completely. Uh, and yeah, I mean, the proxies pattern has been around for quite some time now. And I think uh, React Easy Store was the one of the first ones to use it, which worked pretty well. And this seems to be sort of iteration upon it uh, to simplify it even further so that you, you don't have to, you know, um, create a specific separate store. You already have the global one which might be seen as a shortcoming because that means you only have one store and there's no way to sort of change it, right? You cannot have multi-store setups. But uh, maybe that sounds interesting for you. Maybe you like the how the API looks, so do check it out. Uh, and 
Oh, there's actually a V2 of Recollect with the out with the immutability integrated. That's interesting. But yeah, I mean, it seems curious. So if you are still looking for the React Store solutions, do check it out. Maybe this is your cup of tea. It's called React Recollect and the article is linked in the today's uh, collection of links, basically. Okay, continuing, we got uh, Insights Fiber, in-depth overview of the new reconciliation algorithm in React. Um, we already had articles from uh, Max uh, Karetsky and uh, they were really good. So he's sort of doing those deep dives into the React um, inner workings. And this time around, he's looking at the fiber and the reconciliation algorithm that it has, um, which is, again, it's a very, very large article that goes into incredible depth to have a look at how the React works. So if you are curious about the React inner workings, which again might help you, for example, uh, write more efficient code, right? Or understand better what happens when stuff changes. So all of that is here and, um, or I guess understand why the nodes re-render when the data changes, right? How exactly that works. So if you're curious about that, or maybe you wanna learn and understand React better, then definitely do check this article out, highly recommend it. As I said, it is big and it is very in-depth. So it's essentially, I don't know, it's like probably half an hour read, if not more, when you you know dive into the code and on all the examples, but it's definitely worth it. It's an amazing article, a very well written, very easy to understand, and uh, gives you an incredible insight into the React reconciliation algorithm. So um, do check it out. All right, next thing we got here is messing around with React Native layout animations. And it's essentially a small tutorial on how to animate the transition between two forms, right? So in this case, as uh, you can see here on the GIF, there's a login and sign up form with a toggle up top that switches between them. And then the author just goes on and looks at how do you actually animate that by using the default React Native uh, features, right? So no libraries, no stuff like this, just the core animation framework and um, possible options of doing that. There is a bunch of them. If you are working with React Native and if you are curious how you can use the native animation framework to check it out, it's a basic tutorial essentially, but a quite nice one. All right, um, next thing we got here is lazy loading and preloading components in React 16.6. This is once again, the article that talks about the new features in React 16.6 is specifically React Lazy and um, the suspense and the dynamic imports, right? So before that, before the 16.6, you had to use some third party library for this, but right now you can just uh, literally just use suspense and load it on demand, right? So. The article talks about why you actually would want to load on demand instead of uh, bundling it all away. Uh, and you know, the, the answer is of course, there are networks that can be very slow, like 3G for example, even though 3G is not that slow. Um, some things might um, take ages on it. Like for example, if you look at the example here on the 3G, this is gonna take, um, yeah, about two and a half seconds to load like, 125 kilobytes of JavaScript, right? This is a long time. And um, then the author talks about how do you change that to lazy loading and specifically loading the component only where it's needed. So in this case, it's a stock market thing and you load the specific stock table only when the user clicks on a specific stock, right? So, um, it actually, the author actually shows how do you migrate from the existing codes to the new lazy loading one. Um, I don't think I have any bot set up, Donna, I'm sorry, uh, but I've been up for like 22 minutes, so I'm going to be your bot for today. <laughs> okay. Um, right. So back to the article. Um, yeah, it just walks you through the setup of uh, lazy loading uh, using again React Lazy and imports, uh, dynamic imports specifically, and then using the suspense with a fallback to actually show the loading indicator. So it's a very basic tutorial, but a very well written one. And if you were looking uh, into doing that with your app, this will guide you through the migration from the traditional way of doing that to the lazy loading quite nicely. So do check it out. Okay, next thing we got here is React 16 roadmap. Uh, we got the official roadmap from the React team. 
that outlines the upcoming releases and um, approximate timeline for them. Um, so the TLDR here is, we're gonna get the React hooks sometime in Q1 2019, which is basically, you know, January, I guess, hopefully. Um, we're gonna get the concurrent mode in Q2 2019. And the suspense for data fetching, which is one of the features that I'm quite excited about, is just going to be coming sometime in mid-2019. So if you're curious about the details and all the sort of related information about this, do check out the article itself. There is a pretty detailed explanation of what is coming, when it's coming, and why does it take as much time. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's really cool to see the whole roadmap. So um, yeah, check it out, basically. Okay. Next article we got here is called actually callbacks are fine and uh, it is talking about handling the callback hell using the functional programming and crazy um, functional representations of callbacks which I don't know arguably I would say that this pyramid of doom that you see on the screen right now is easier to read than the result at the end while you know it looks Flatter, but this formatting over here makes it painfully hard to understand what the hell is going on, at least for me. And I think if I would, you know, write a code like this and come back to it um, even probably a month later, I would already forget what the hell is happening here because this is, it is a bit hard to read, to be honest. Like when you format it like this, maybe it's okay, but having to add pretty or ignore to it just to be able to format it in this way is a bit weird. Nonetheless, the article itself is quite interesting and does gives you a um, sort of perspective or how, of how you could handle the callbacks using functional programming, carrying and uh, returning higher order functions essentially. Um, and yeah, if, if, you know, if you're curious, do check it out. I don't know if I would use that in my code. Then again, you know, this is one of the reasons why I think that going completely into the functional programming or completely into the object-oriented programming doesn't really work that well for uh, JavaScript at least, maybe for me as well. Uh, but it is an interesting exercise nonetheless, so do check it out. All right, uh, next thing we got here is a GraphQL, a retrospective, a pretty interesting retrospective on uh, sticking with GraphQL from uh, 2017 essentially until now. Uh, to basically um, outlook, you know, did the GraphQL help him and what kind of problems did they have with it? So there was some pretty interesting edge cases and uh, the interesting problems that the GraphQL actually solved for them. If you're considering GraphQL, do check it out and see what kind of things you can expect two years down the line, essentially. Uh, Donna, thank you once again for the uh, cheering. Okay, uh, next article we got here is what exactly is the DOM? This is a pretty detailed write-up about the document object model or the DOM as you know, you might or might not know it. If you already know what the DOM is, you won't really find anything amazingly new here. If you are still confused what the DOM is and how exactly it works, this article actually explains everything very well. I mean, the DOM is not extremely complex concept and this is probably like a 10 minute read. But it does give you a very good examples. It does walk you through everything you have to know about DOM. So yeah, do check it out. Um, all right, continuing. We got testing Jest from zero to hero. This is an introduction to Jest and majority of its features. So the Jest has incredible amount of features and I like, without a doubt right now, it's my favorite testing framework. And this article does a pretty good job of uh, highlighting the best ones, like for example, snapshot testing, like the interactive mode. And um, I think, what does it talk about as well? Uh, yeah, the batteries included is in the coverage, notifications and all that kind of stuff, as well as debugging with VS code when you need it. So if you were curious about Jest but never used it, this will basically give you a pretty good introduction into the basic features. Um, I would recommend going to the Jest documentation and reading it because there is a lot more to it than just snapshots and interactive testing. But yes, Jest is awesome, so do check it out. Okay, and uh, another article we got here is why do we write super props? This is actually a new blog from Dan Abramov. Uh, so if you're curious about all things React, I would highly suggest you follow it. 
it's called overreacted and it looks like it's going to be awesome so this specific article talks about uh, why exactly do we need to write super props in our react components when we build them as classes right so what is happening and why do you have to do that if you have a constructor so if you ever was curious why is that needed then do check it out it is a very clear and very extensive explanation of what is happening underneath the react classes uh, so yeah all right this is it for the article and news and now we are coming to the primary topic of the podcast i guess you could say that the whole event stream incident that happened this week so if you somehow missed it uh this week the event stream package that is installed by more than or I mean, essentially it has more than two million installs per day was compromised so um the new maintainer added the flat map stream 0.1.1 and then um, upgraded some additional dependencies to hide it and pushed a new version that essentially included compromised code, which basically tried to steal your Bitcoins if you had any. I believe it was Bitcoin, basically cryptocurrency. Let's just call it cryptocurrency, right? So if you installed the event stream package, it would try to find the encrypted cryptocurrency wallet. I think it was some specific one. And try to steal it and that is a package that has um, over 2 million installs per day which is crazy it was compromised for i think more than 24 hours so the after like the, the fallout of all of this is quite crazy and uh, there is a lot of people talking about that um i think there is this discussion this ticket is yeah like more than a thousand comments and people were having problems of actually commenting on this later on which is just insane now here's the thing um, the original author of the um, package Dominic Tarr he was no longer maintaining it right so it was just laying there and he was like okay I don't I no longer care about that I'm no, not maintaining it and um, I'm just gonna give it away to some guy who asked for it now here's the thing people were like why would you give it away to a random person well the thing is that this random person right now in control he actually before asking for the maintenance rights or and for publishing rights he actually contributed to the package for multiple weeks he was actually sending meaningful useful comments and you know updating dependencies fixing tests dropping old versions of travis and so on and so forth and then at some point he was like hey can i just maintain it from now on because you know i have time i want to do that why would you say no to that if you don't care about this package anymore so obviously the author said yeah sure here you go you can now be the maintainer and you can now have the publishing rights and the guy just go and does malicious stuff so um the first thing uh, that i'm i'm gonna highlight this is sort of the gist of the what happened right so the first thing that i'm gonna highlight here is the statement from the dominic tar himself on the package itself so um the uh, thing that I want to talk like there's a pretty big write up here that you can check out yourself but uh, essentially uh, here's the highlight of it right this is the gist of open source I didn't create this code for altruistic motivations I created it for fun I was learning and learning is fun I gave it away because it was easy to do and because sharing helps uh, sharing helps people learn I think the most small modules in npm were created for reasons like this and uh then it comes to say you know there's nothing it's not fun anymore you get literally nothing from maintaining a popular package and that is one of the problems uh hey bakao welcome to the stream yes there is a lot of comments and there is an insane discussion going on around it and people blaming him which is stupid as hell now uh let's just continue down this rabbit hole right so there's another article from uh, Chris Northwood who is talking about this I mean the article's title is like today's JavaScript trash fire and pylon and it talks about so this is more of a timeline of what exactly happened you know so 9 September the user right control adds flat map stream as dependency then he rewrites the code to remove dependency someone pushes the flat map stream 1.1 and appended the minimites code that actually uh, steal the cryptocurrencies and then through sheer luck just because the malicious code actually used the api that's been deprecated somebody noticed it so if, if the malicious code would have been written a bit better 
nobody would ever notice that. This is the most terrifying part of it, actually. And yeah, then there is, as you can see, it's been actually around there for quite some time and it took quite some time to actually fix all of that. And the, the article goes into discussion, you know, so how, how, how could we prevent that? And you couldn't know that this guy would be malicious because he actually genuinely contributed to package, right? And uh, the NPM might be the problem, but how would you solve this? The code signing maybe would have solved the package, but then again, you know, he got the full access to it. So it's like, I don't know, maybe reproducible builds would solve the package, but then again, it's like, yeah, reproducible builds mean that you can compare the source code, but who would actually do that? It means you have to actually look yourself, you know? So it all comes down to trust. So it raises some very valid points to check it out. Now, here's the most terrifying part of it. Event stream was so widespread that even the VS code had to do a blog post about that. So the team, uh, because some of the VS codes uh, packages were affected and um, yeah, if you have any of those updated, you like you have to check your RPC and have to make sure you remove all of that stuff and or update. I think they've actually the community already fixed that at this point it's just safe to update. But uh, yeah, uh, restricted build access, but the guy had the full rights to repository, right? He was considered to be a good actor because he has contributed to repo for several weeks and like how you already you already trust him, right? So what restrict from what? It's, it's, it's like, it's a tricky one. It all comes down to trust as the previous article said, and it's, you know, it's a social engineering at its, at its work essentially. You just fool the maintainer to think that you're a good guy and then you screw it over. Okay, uh, there's a event stream vulnerability explained article. This one is a bit more technical. So it actually talks about what exactly the, how exactly the attack worked and how exactly the malicious code looked and what it does. So it actually goes through it by line by line to uh, figure out what exactly happens. So if you're interested in technical details, do check it out. And then there are some uh, thoughts from the community essentially that I wanna highlight. Um, this one is from the uh, George Walk, the guy who works on uh, React.js and ReasonML at Facebook Engineering. And um, yeah, the just idea is, you know, I get nothing from maintaining this library that 2 million applications receive value from. What could go wrong? This isn't a package manager problem. It's a culture problem. We neglect or even demonize financially supporting those who create works in service to others. Don't let money ruin purity of open source. It might be an encrypted wallet stealing code injection, but it's a pure encrypted stealing code injection. Um, I think that this, this mindset of you know it's it's wrong to um, it's wrong to somehow monetize the open source is 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 actually very harmful, right? And this is what a lot of people highlight. It's like uh, I recently saw an article that talked about the storybook of authors trying to monetize their work, and was like they are trying to steal it from open source community. No, they're not. They're trying to make a living. Like they had to, they have to live from something. They, they, they spend their time working on those things. And if it doesn't bring them anything, why would they continue working on it? And this is exactly what happened in this case. Dominic Tarr has more than, uh, I think 800 packages on NPM, which is insane. There's no way in the world that he would work on any of them and you know maintaining any of them if he doesn't get any money from this. He's a human person and he has to eat something and to live, you know, he can't just do it for free all the time. This is not how the world works, unfortunately. Uh, we are not in some communist utopia, but um, yeah, it is a very sad state of things. And uh, this is one part of the problem. Uh, hey, Samohavitz, welcome to the stream. Uh, do a diff compare with the minified version and build script result. I mean, this is again, this this is coming down to, we actually have reproducible builds and we can have a look at the source code. But the thing is you would still have to look at the source yourself, right? So majority, like what, how many people do actually check their dependency updates and look into source code to see if anything malicious is there? I'm guessing 000.1%, like someone who has like guidelines, strict guidelines to do that in like working in financial banking or whatever. Nobody else does, because why would you do that? You trust those guys, right? And um, apparently that's not actually what you want to do. So 
Yeah. Um, that does not end the discussion. So Jordan Walk actually goes in to say that the NPM package malware is also a technology problem. So it's not just the mindset, but it's also a technology problem, right? Because there is at least some way to figure out that there might be a problem if we have dependencies that install, build at install time from the original inspectable sources on your machine. And there's a bit of longer discussion in here. And uh, this is apparently what the reason or camel team trying to solve right now. It's a very interesting insight. So if you're curious about the tech part, do check it out. Like it still won't solve the problem of, you know, needing to actually go and inspect the whole thing, but it will give at least some way to do that instead of, you know, like hiding traces with the new releases like the guy did with the current package, right? Um, but yeah. Um, then we got, so the topic got so heated that we got an open letter from uh, Rich Hickey, who is the closure, uh, one of the authors of the closure. And uh, I, I guess very renowned figure in open source, uh, who is who wrote a piece called open source is not about you, which is basically says that uh, people are not entitled to open source. They are not entitled to a time of an author who publishes open source, which is absolutely correct. And all those people who expect the open source authors and creators, and they're not even talking about open source, you know, like people making videos to you on YouTube or people making art or people making music. You can cannot expect anything from them unless you pay them, right? And this is sort of the thing that makes sense. And it's it just feels so weird that you actually have to specifically spell it out for people. But uh, apparently there are people who don't really understand that. and it, just makes me quite sad um yeah that's that's actually it for the event stream section it is ridiculous situation which is very sad uh, mostly due to the reaction of people who are actually involved uh, or like who was affected by it i mean i guess you know i get it you're angry you were maybe your crypto was stolen which is again a bit silly but whatever but um there's, you you cannot expect a person to figure out that someone was malicious while he contributed legitimately contributed to project for several weeks like why would you have any doubts about giving him the rights to contribute to the project if he actually sent meaningful contributions for the past x weeks like it just boggles my mind how you can blame the author this is insane oh but yeah uh, yeah <laughs> Yeah, thanks, man. I mean, I'm doing it for fun and education as well. You know, this is this is the whole point. I, again, if if it gets boring or uneducational, I'm likely going to stop it. And um, I guess there will be some people who are angry about it. But I don't know. It's it's just it's a ridiculous mindset. But OK, well, let's stop talking about sad things and switch to the tiny bits of awesomeness that we got here today. And uh, yeah, the first one we got here is the read line actually now supports the async iteration in node master. So that has not been released as far as I know yet. But uh, the cool thing is that you can now actually do this. So you can create a read line and face and then do for a weight of const line of read line and read line by line like this. It is, it is awesome. Like this looks really great. Um, yeah, Donna, thank you very much for your support. I really appreciate all the donation cheers and all the, you know, subscriptions and whatever you guys do. This is like, this what, what this is basically what keeps me going, guys. So thank you very much. Okay, continuing. We got um, introducing Value Explorer for Quokka. So if you didn't know, Quokka JS is a pretty cool plugin for a bunch of uh, IDEs like VS Code, Atom, and a uh, bunch of others that allows you to write interactive code, right? So you actually get the results in line, which is really nice. And now they've added value explorer that literally allows you to explore the current stack, which is insane. And this looks just so cool. And all of that just runs in your IDE. Like it's already one of my favorite tools for quickly testing things, um, either this or a console from the browser, which has less features now, basically. But this is just awesome. Like, look at this stuff. So if you never saw Quokka, do check it out. It is really great. Um, yeah, just, just check it out. This new feature is just killer. Okay, 
Next thing we got here is announcing support for CSS prop in style components. So you can basically uh, write the CSS prop in uh, React and it's great. Uh, looks quite nice. Um, and I guess, you know, since the style component is gonna be extracted into one CSS file and works more or less the same way as style components and adds zero kilobyte overhead, which is kind of great. Uh, it only works in the scratch files though. Yes, it does only works in the scratch files. I mean, for the real project, you are just attach the debugger, right? And um, it's basically the same. Uh, what is the CSS props? Um, you, you know, like the style components allow you to write the styles elements in React, right? And this is how you do it normally. So you have styled something and then you have the CSS attached to it. And uh, now you can just add the CSS here. So the, from my understanding, I'm not uh, that much knowledgeable about styled components because I never use them. But from my understanding, what happens is it takes those styles and extracts them into a standalone CSS file. So that actually is gonna be optimized, minified and everything for you. You don't have to care about that, but you can still write it in a nice, you know, sort of traditional manner, let's put it this way. Uh, if you want more details, do check out the library itself. As I said, you know, I didn't really work that much with it, but uh, this new format actually, I mean, I didn't work much with it because I don't like this way of writing it. As in, you know, I should define the styled button and then write the, use it as a tag literal thing. Um, seems like extends which already comes with the, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it is an extension of what already came with styled components, exactly. So it's nothing new, it's just additional, more like, uh, you know, visual thing, basically. Um, just another feature, that, that's it. So there's nothing uh, too revolutionary about it, <laughs> if that's what you're talking about. You got it right, it's just a new feature, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, here's an interesting thing. So we got this uh, node compiler collection thing that I presented earlier. And then we got the parcel.js author who is like, hey, parcel can actually already do that. <laughs> which is kind of amusing and um, proves the point that Parcel.js is actually an incredible piece of software that is um, still has the documentation that sometimes is a bit lacking. So I'm hoping the Parcel 2 will actually have a better uh, reference or maybe the NCC will push them to add the better docs with relation to node modules because it's actually cool that you already have all the planned features that NCC wanted in one command and parcel, which is kind of great when you think about it. Okay, next thing we got here is the uh, PSA from the Node.js team. So Node.js LTS team opted to shorten active LTS period of uh, version 8.x and it will go into maintenance in January 1st. So make sure to update to Node 10 LTS if you are running on 8 still uh, because you have less time essentially and you know they from uh, January 1st they're going to be doing just the maintenance and specific uh, security fixes and nothing else okay next thing we got here is pretty exciting uh, Babel 3 has merged private class methods into stage uh, so they moved into stage 3 and are now merged into the Babel master so you will actually be able to use them uh, in the new Babel releases, which is quite cool. Um, there was a link somewhere about the testing. There we go. So you can now write the private classes, which are the private properties uh, on the classes, which means you can use the prefix them with the hash and they will be only private. So you will not be able to access them from the, from the outside, right? So the test private would actually return false or undefined in this case, right? Which is kind of exciting. Uh, not just that, but uh, private fields and public fields on classes are now in Chrome. Uh, and uh, private fields are there just behind the flag, I believe. And public fields are the ones that allow you to define the field as in, you know, the field equals uh, something. They will be shipped in, uh, enabled by default in Chrome 72 for desktop, Android, and Android WebView as well, which is kind of awesome. So quite excited to uh, see this coming to the Node.js in the next uh, release of, I don't know, I'm hoping version 11, but we're gonna see. Okay, 
Uh, and yeah, the last thing I got here, I think this is the last thing, but whatever. So we got this stage zero proposal to add a pluggable type system to JavaScript. Uh, so if you, you're a fan of TypeScript, maybe soon you will have TypeScript in JavaScript, which yeah, basically the proposal is to add the um, annotation that would allow you to write types right in your code. And at runtime, those types would be converted to comments essentially, right? So this is will be only the types for users. So the compiler parser and so on and so forth would still work the same as before, but the annotation would transform those uh, and allow you to write this uh, into the um, code, which basically turns JavaScript into TypeScript at this point. And um, I, I don't know, I think, this is kind of cool. So if I would be able to use types in uh, in JavaScript, I would probably use them in some places. So like not everywhere, but um, yeah, I guess I would. Again, this is a stage zero strawman proposal. So it's not even accepted into TC39 as far as I know, uh, but it is still quite exciting to see people push for the types in the core. Um, yeah, it is quite curious. Uh, hey, Manda Putra, welcome to the stream. All right, um, now we got the releases section. The first release is the OMI version 5.0. That is the view framework, another one of those. I think we already covered it a couple of times. Uh, that basically they tailored the new version towards the MVVM architecture and they give some examples here. I, I never had time to actually check it out, but if you are curious or maybe you're fan of MVVM architectures, do check it out. I mean, it seems quite nice. They also use like J6 and stuff. Maybe this is what you want, but I don't really have much to say about it, to be honest. Uh, next thing we got here is Emotion 10, a pretty major release of the Emotion uh, styling plugin that adds uh, quite a bunch of things, including the CSS prop as well. That seems to be all the heat right now. Um, hey, Gugitona, I hope I read that correctly. <laughs> but let's just go with that. Probably not, but uh, apologies in the advance. I am terrible with usernames, so let's just gonna go with that. So you got the global component and zero config server-side rendering, which is really cool and something that a lot of those styling things don't really support, which is uh, one of the reasons I think the Next.js guys uh, rolled with their own solution. But yeah, if you're using Emotion, do check out version 10. That seems to be pretty exciting major release. Okay, then we got a minor LTS release of a uh, note version 10.14. This is a security release and everyone who is using LTS should update to it. It contains the fixes for at least five CVEs, which is insane when you think about it. Uh, two of them are open cell and three of them are Node.js related, including some DOS attacks, hostname spoofing and lower is HTTP DOS. Um, so yes, if you are using LTS, do make sure to upgrade because this is an important security release. Right, and uh, next thing we got here is Fastify version 2RC actually. So this is the release candidate for now, but it's really cool to see Fastify basically releasing another, another major version. I am a huge fan and I think I've used it in a uh, majority of my projects right now. So they've, uh, it doesn't seem like it's gonna have any breaking changes or major breaking changes. So most of the code should still keep working, but they are adding additional like sanity and, you know, things, um, quality of life improvements, let's just put it this way. So yeah, if you are curious, do check it out. Fastify is great and uh, looks like Fastify 2 will be even better. Uh, more issues with URL parsing. I mean, URL parsing is always quirky and problematic because there is just <laughs> no right way to do that. Uh, but yeah. Right, next thing we got here is TypeScript 3.2. It was released on November 29. And uh, the major highlights are rest spread on generic types and big in support. Everything else is basically very TypeScript specific and I can't really tell you much about it because I'm not really using TypeScript that much, but uh, if you are, do check it out. It seems to be a pretty cool release. Next thing we got here is Atom133 with built-in Rust support, a better GitHub package and uh, soft wrapping improvements as well as ability to disable snippets and some performance improvements for bracket matching. Um, once again, I'm curious to see how the whole Atom versus VS Code will develop since GitHub was acquired by Microsoft and uh, yeah. 
It feels a bit weird that they actually built in the Rust support, but um, why not? All right, that's it for the releases. Now we are getting to the libraries and demos section. And the first library we got here is Progress Estimator, and it's a command line tool that allows you to estimate progress of a task and show a nice uh, progress bar automatically, which is kind of neat. So if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. I feel that VS Code is doing better. Uh, I mean, it's like, I guess it depends on, on what you work with. Uh, I would say VS Code is definitely doing better with regards to JavaScript community. Let's just put it this way. I know that Atom is quite popular with the uh, Rust and Golang communities, for example, because they have a pretty good packages. <clears throat> Again, that may be my perception because of the people who I talk to, you know, so it might be, might be quite wrong, I guess. Unless we see the survey, it's, it's a bit hard to tell. <laughs> but uh, I mean, it's still alive, so it's still developed, it's really cool. All right, uh, next thing we got here is drag and drop, accessible drag and drop list reorder module. So this is a framework agnostic, so pure JavaScript list reordering module that is um, accessibility friendly, essentially. So uh, works with React as well. So do check it out. Looks quite nice, but then again, if you're using React, I would say um, have a look at the beautiful React D&D because this is just amazing. All right, uh, next thing we got here is Tau Prolog, Prolog interpreter in JavaScript. Uh, so if you ever wanted to write Prolog in a browser, now you can. I honestly never learned Prolog, but uh, maybe I should because it looks interesting and I don't know, and now I can just do it in my browser. There's like a REPL here and you can even do like derivation tree visualization and everything, which is insane, uh, but uh, really cool. So check it out. Next thing we got here is Refract, um, basically a library that allows you to harness the power of reactive programming to supercharge your components. Uh, what this really means is it allows you to use reactive programming libraries with um, different UI frameworks like React, Inferno, Preact, and Redux. Or not just React, uh, not just uh, front end, I guess. Good cat thing. Not just UI frameworks. So it allows you to uh, wrap your components in special um, higher order functions and then just use your observables right in the component itself, which works quite well, it seems. It's a very nice way of handling them because working with reactive like observables essentially in any UI components can be a bit of a pain. Um, and a lot of people have tried doing, you know, simplifying it. Uh, and this one seems to be like one of the nicer ways of doing it because you can literally just um, get the work with observable as if it was like a like a value, right? It was kind of neat. Uh, do check it out if you're working with RxJS or any of this, you know, I think it works nice like, like Rx, callback, most, and extreme. Yeah, there you go. Okay, next thing we got here is Jest Electron Runner from uh, Facebook Atom uh, folks. Um, I guess it's just Facebook folks in this case, but <laughs> yes, uh, they wrote a custom test runner for Jest that allows tests to be run in Electron environment. So you can actually use Jest to test your Electron apps, which is kind of awesome and it is super easy to set up. You just add a specific runner and a specific test environment and you're done. You can test your Electron packages or Electron apps in using Jest, which is kind of amazing. Okay, continuing, we got a hard tag, uh, ultralight library for working with cookies in JavaScript. A pretty straightforward cookie library. So um, yeah, why use cookies if there's local storage? Uh, because local storage might, I mean, there's a different reasons for that, right? Uh, first of all, local storage doesn't really have expiration. You have to handle that yourself. This is for once. Second of all, local storage cannot be set on path and uh, subdomains and stuff like that. Oh, no, I guess it, it's gonna work on subdomains, right? But you can't really set it to path, for example. There is a bunch of reasons as I think there's been more than one article uh, about that. So uh, do check it out. Plus. Uh, when the, um, what I want to say, I wanted to say that, no, that's a good question. Okay, I mean, <laughs> doesn't work on private browsing. Uh, yes, private browse, but I mean, cookies are gonna be wiped on private browsing as well, right? So that's not exactly a valid, um, valid argument here either. 
But that's, I, I mean, just Google for it. There's more than one article talking about that. There are valid use cases for just cookies or for just uh, L storage. Don't even get set, really. Private browsing local storage. Handle, uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, no, I cut. Private browsing local storage. Um, right, there was a Mozilla links over here. Celebrate private browsing according to section. Web storage API. Let's have, I'm curious. Sorry, I'm just really curious about that. Most modern browsers support a privacy or something. This is fundamentally incompatible web apps. Okay. Most browsers have opted for the strategy where storage APIs are still available and seemingly functional, but they are, oh, no, but yeah, but that does seem to set it. It's just get wiped after you close the window, right? So that's what I was assuming as well. So it just works, but then when you close the window, it just gets cleaned. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense of doing that. <laughs> And the same goes for cookies, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the whole point of private browsing. You just don't have any state. You don't have cookies, you don't have storage. It's just like you can still set it, but as soon as you close the private window, it will just be wiped, which is exactly what I thought it would, the way it would work essentially. So it still works, it still is set, but as soon as you close it, you lose everything, including cookies, by the way. Okay. Next library we've got here is scrollpub.js, uh, responsive and written in pure JavaScript that shows your scroll progress, like this tiny bar on top. Um, I mean, maybe you were looking for something like this. Seems to be pretty straightforward and uh, pretty easy to install. So do check it out. I think the issue I had with Safari private browsing with LS, uh, it might be Safari. I mean, Safari has so many quirks, it's insane. Like I wouldn't hold it to, you know, uh, if it's purely Safari problem, then it's likely quirk of Safari rather than the quirk of private browsing. Let's just put it this way. <laughs> okay, uh, continuing, we got wide buff here, online collaborative whiteboard in uh, Node.js. So it's literally a whiteboard where you can do things together with other people. It's open source and there is a public board with a lot of silly things. And I really hope when I open it, we won't see dicks all over the screen. Well, okay, we did see award pennies, but uh, it's a good start. Um, but yeah, it basically allows you to either draw or text or erase or hands, which is moving or, you know, draw straight lines or draw rectangles. So if you're curious how to build something like this, or maybe you were looking for something like this for your um, collaboration sessions, do check it out, seems to be quite nice. Next thing we got here is Nest CSS, a Nest style CSS framework. Did you ever wanted to make your website look like it was a very old Nest game? Now you can, um, now you can do that. So there's even linking radios. <laughs> this is incredible. Like this is really cool. Um, so yes, if you ever wanted to have some of that 8-bit aesthetic, do check it out. This is quite neat. Next thing we got here is KBD Audio. A tool for capturing and analyzing keyboard input paired with microphone capture. So uh, I think the the um, paper on it is quite old. So there was a scientific paper that talked about deducing the passwords by using the sound. So you know that by the sound of your typing on a keyboard, you can actually figure out what keys are being pressed by using the deep learning. And this is a live demo built with WebAssembly. Um, it requires WebAssembly threads, which is behind the flag, but uh, you can do it. I think I have it disabled actually. Um, yes, I have it disabled, okay. But uh, the thing is you can actually run it and then type something on keyboard and you will see a predicted output, which is terrifying. And uh, yes, as someone said, you should not type the passwords when Skyping or, you know, streaming or whatever. So you can guys basically now find out my passwords to the private keys, I think, because I've typed those more than once. <laughs> uh, but yes, it's a really neat demo and it's a web assembly. So if you are curious, um, do check it out. It does require threads that are in the, um, behind the flags right now, but hey, it does work. So quite, quite cool. All right. Continuing, we got Displaceable, tiny JavaScript library that handles super smooth element displacement on mouse move. So this is basically like, you know, the parallax emulation in iOS, for example, uh, but using the mouse. There's a live demo for that. Works quite nice and it's configurable and it's quite basic. So maybe you were looking for something like this. Okay. 
Next thing we got here is React Stepper Wizard. This is exactly what you expect. It's a React Stepper. Um, and uh, yeah, you can create a bunch of pages using it. I honestly think that, you know, if you're creating a stepper like this, those should be a different pages, not a wizard and uh, preferably a pages that have different URIs so that if you refresh it, you will still be there. But uh, maybe you were looking for a simpler component. So check it out. Okay, next thing we got here is Node-Env. Manage multiple Node.js versions with this package. Uh, I think at least from the understanding of it, I never used it. It looks very similar to NVM, but with just a bit more options essentially. Um, so if you want to manage different node versions, but don't want NVM for some reason, check out Node.env. Maybe this is what you want. I haven't used it, so I can't really say more about that. All right, next thing we got here is Onyx.js from Microsoft team, which is kind of awesome. This is a library for running um, machine learning, specifically Onyx models in browser and node. But I think it also supports TensorFlow and Keras. And uh, look at those charts here. So it actually claims to be like significantly faster than TensorFlow.js and Keras.js, which is insane, especially for CPU bound tasks. Uh, do you have iTunes podcast SoundCloud? Yes, I do have. I mean, uh, there is the CastBox. Um, uh, I published it in CastBox as MP3s. And I have submitted it to iTunes, but I'm still waiting for the approval. I don't know why it takes so long, but um, yeah. There's a CastBox MP3 and uh, there's an RSS if you want to have it. Uh, the link should be either in description or in the repository in the channel description below. Uh, okay, but yes, if you're working with um, WebAssembly, oh, sorry, if you're working with um, neural networks in the browser and if you want to run them a lot faster than the TensorFlow.js and Keras.js do, do check it out. This seems to be a pretty cool library and backed by Microsoft. So yeah, seems to be quite neat. Okay, continuing, we got Puppet Run. Run anything JavaScript in headless Chrome from your collab. I just had to screw it up. Run anything headless, uh, God damn it. <laughs> right, let me try this again. Run anything JavaScript in a headless Chrome from your command line. It essentially allows you to run any script in a headless browser that will be executed in line and do anything you want and get the outputs. Uh, like for example, you can use it to run tests, which is, you know, like Mocha or tape or stuff like this. I not, maybe you would want that, but um, yeah, I don't know. I, I personally prefer to use Puppeteer directly, but maybe you just want something simpler. Next thing we got here is the, I think this is the last actually library and uh, demo section thing. And this is the International Obfuscated JavaScript Code Contest. So if you wanna try your hands at obfuscating code, then, uh, do check it out. There is a bunch of rules and uh, you have to basically provide the most obfuscated code ever to win, I think. Sounds quite fun and I'm actually curious to see what the results will be. So um, yeah. Okay. We got a bunch of silly things to close this whole thing off. Uh, the first one is this tweet wanted. Uh, I think this actually came from the uh, the whole, again, event stream discussions and everything, you know. Wanted 10x rockstar developer, responsibilities, merging PRs immediately, making new features on demands, fixing bugs right now, compensation, stars plus one, threats general and specific, public shaming, apply at OSS Inc. today. Yes, 10x rockstar developer, you didn't know it's a thing? <laughs> there there's an amazing comic here. I think this is quite old, but it's still like one of the best comics about the Rockstar developers. We're hiring for the Rockstar developer to join our team and guy just starts throwing the monitors, injecting himself with drugs and then just, you know, vomiting on the floor, which is like, what do you expect from a Rockstar? Uh, it's a silly joke, but um, yes. Fixing the problem without any description of it. Yeah, that's also a very valid point. <laughs> But um, yeah, it is a bit, uh, again, it's, it's sort of a very funny joke, but it makes me sad that, you know, this is kind of the mindset we have towards the people producing stuff for free. It just makes you sad. Okay, the next thing we got here is the, from I am developer tweet, which tends to produce some very hilarious things from time to time. And uh, this is the if they joke. 
developers, if they approach you with pizza at 5.25 p.m., they are not your friend. That's a p.m. bribing you to work late. And um, I'm guessing everyone had a situation like this once, well, once, once in a time. So yeah, this, this just strikes too close to home. All right. And um, the last thing I want to show is actually an um, interesting thing that was announced at the uh, Amazon, um, AWS, whatever the conference they had recently. I'm, I'm almost forgetting the name of it. It's called Firecracker, and it's a secure, fast micro VMs for serverless computing. This is essentially what the Amazon Web Services Lambda functions run on, which is kind of awesome that they open sourced it. Reinvent, yes, thank you, AWS Reinvent. Um, they claim that this is essentially a VMs, right? But micro VMs, and they could start in milliseconds. Like, I think the claim was something like under 100 milliseconds, which is kind of insane to have the safety of virtual machine and the speed of essentially a Docker container. So I am, um, I feel like I need to investigate this more and maybe build something on top of it because uh, this just looks really awesome. And you know, as much as I like Docker, there's some shortcomings to it and uh, VMs have definitely provide more, uh, more, um, what do you put it? More safety, right? I thought the Rust have slow starts. Uh, I mean, Rust maybe, but you just start the Firecracker daemon once, right? So, and then the daemon just spins up the VMs for you. So I'm not exactly sure how it works internally, but the whole idea of having uh, VMs instead of Docker containers that are as fast as Docker containers is just incredible. So like, I, I don't know if like some of you might be new to podcast. If yes, then I have this ExoFrame tool that allows you to deploy uh, services using uh, one line commands essentially, right? And it's based on Docker. And uh, uh, it's simple. But okay, how do I put it? So the idea of ExoFrame is that you should be run one command, should be able to run one command and then get a deployment, right? All of this is based on Docker, and there is a lot of overhead because of it, because you have to assemble images and then run them, and then there's like routing, and then there's a lot of other things that can be a bit iffy to handle, basically. So. Um, what are the shortcomings comes to head? I mean, Docker has a lot of problems. Like it's not, it's not, it's not a perfect solution, right? We had, for example, we had, um, um, we had, uh, so we had, a, we have this pretty major project that is called Hobbit Project. It's a scientific project uh, that aims to provide a platform for testing big data systems, right? So it's supposed to run. It takes your system, runs it on a cluster of like, I think seven uh, pretty large servers with like terabytes of memory, and then uh, benchmarks it with the big data, right? We, we built it above the Docker swarm. And oh man, how many issues we had with the swarm and the reconciliation, it's insane. Swarm is very quirky. So as soon as something goes wrong in the swarm, then it can just fall apart, literally. So like, you know, one node falls off and Swarm just goes crazy. And you are like, oh, come on. Uh, okay, let me address the chat. You put a firecracker in your friend's pants. Um, that sounds like a very terrible thing to do. <laughs> Please don't do that. Um, what are the shortcomings? Okay, so the shortcomings we have addressed. Um, doo -doo -doo. Uh, yes, okay, so allow that. Uh, let me just have a quick look at that. Amount of click commands Docker has is, yes. So the overhead, like, yeah, that's another thing of the Docker is that it is, it is still a very complex system. And this is why I built ExoFrame because I got tired of doing the same things over and over again, even though Docker does simplifies a lot of them. I still cannot just run one command to deploy a thing to a server, right? I have to do a lot of things. So ExoFrame does this for me now. This is like, you know, but then again, it's, it's still not quite where I want it to be. Uh, okay. Have you heard of Amazon Web Services? Why not deploy it there? Well, there's a bunch of reasons. Amazon Web Services, first of all, it doesn't, it doesn't work when you have a specific requirements like in, so I, I work in university, right? We do scientific projects and majority of time we have requirement of running our own hardware. So we actually buy servers and install them in the data center. 
And in this case, yeah, Amazon Web Services is awesome, but you cannot really use them, right? Because we already have our server, so you have to self-host everything. And uh, Docker in this case works nicely up until certain points. So yeah, so Firecracker looks kind of great. And I don't know, I, I'm kind of pondering about the idea. Uh, tell your university, I mean, that's not university. I, it's like, the Amazon Web Services is not the perfect solution as well, right? So it's not like you cannot, if you would, uh, so, okay, so here's, here's again, the example is Hobbit project, right? So we got the Hobbit project. We have seven servers and those servers are really big and we paid like, I don't, rem I don't, I don't remember the exact number. It was like 20,000 euro or something to buy all of them. They're really beefy with really like 128 core CPUs and, I think like half terabyte of RAM each or something along those lines. If you would rent this kind of hardware on Amazon Web Services, you will burn through the money in like a few months. This is too expensive. Like literally, it's just too expensive. You cannot run a project like this on Amazon Web Services unless you're Amazon. So yeah, your argument doesn't really hold here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it is like, you know, if you are, if you are running something that is, um, that is easier to essentially run on Amazon web services, absolutely. You should go for that. It's just simpler to handle and you don't have to think about the infrastructure. Um, how do you imagine Exaframe in the ideal? You said it's not perfect. Uh, I mean, Exaframe has a lot of shortcomings and it's, it does its job for me at least. But there is, as you can see here, there's a lot of plans to do, to work with it. I mean, ideally I would actually want, um, I would actually want a platform that I can deploy, not just the complete services, like, you know, the website or something, but I also can deploy functions, right? So Amazon has uh, Lambda and there's like a lot of other services that allow you to deploy function, but all of them are still complex. Like, you know, it takes a lot of time to set it up. It takes a lot of time to, configure it, there's the CLI, there's the settings and all of that takes ages. But I just wanna write a tiny script that for example, will query a specific website every 30 seconds. And then once something changes, send it to me, um, I don't know, send me an email, for example, hey, you know, this thing is on sale or just deploy a function that would talk to a Node.js in the backend or sorry, MongoDB in the backend and send me a results when they are ready, for example, right? Because I do run a lot of queries on databases that are like few terabytes and it takes half a day for this query to run. So I just wait for it. So um, yeah, and um, I mean, it's, it's just like, I've been thinking about functions for a long time and I don't know if it should be part of Exaframe or just something completely different. Maybe something built on top of Firecracker is like there. Basically, there's a lot of space for improvement here, right? Um, Amazon. So Amazon Web Services can get pricey. I mean, the thing about Amazon Web Services is that if you use it correctly, if it fits your use case, it will be cheaper than anything out there. If you just try to use it as your typical hosting, it can get pricey very fast. Uh, again, you know, it's just about anything in software development. There is no perfect solution for everything. So Amazon Web Services work fine for one thing, and then there's something else that works perfectly fine for other things, right? So there's no thing that is universal. Onoha, so that, let's, let's delve into the Japanese hosting, it seems. Um, that is indeed in, in, I guess, uh, thousand JPY months. I don't know how much is that actually, uh, in Euro. So I am terrible with converting currency. So we're going to convert that to Euro 13 Euro per month for two gigs of Ram, three cores and 50. Uh, that's expensive. Actually. I mean, I'm, I'm hosting my things. That is expensive. Uh, that is not cheap. I'm hosting my stuff on Scaleway and for uh, seven euro, for eight euro, you actually get four cores, four gigs and hundred gigs of SSD, which is NVMe. So this is cheap. And um, yeah, I mean, the Konoha thing is, I would say it's quite expensive. 
So for the same, okay, just a bit more than 13 bucks, you can get eight cores, eight gigs and 200 gigs of SSD. So yeah, it's like Scaleway is really cheap. Uh, there is also the German company Hetzner that I am a relatively uh, big fan of, but they are only in Germany. So they only have German data servers but you can get a dedicated server for like the second hand. There's, they have this server browser, the dedicated old pre-owned servers for ridiculously low prices. Like you can get 16 gigs of RAM, uh, three terabyte RAID and i7 CPU for 24 euro per month, which is like nothing. Yeah, so um, I mean, I, I don't know if actually Scaleway has a Asian, uh, Asian region, this is a good question. Our infrastructure, oh, they only have the European ones. Okay, so that might be a problem for you if, you, if you're in Asia, uh, but yeah. Okay, um, anything else you guys wanna discuss? If not, then we can just wrap it up here for today because that's literally all I've got. Um, once again, huge thanks for watching, cheering, donating and supporting me in any ways you guys do. Uh, it's always, always awesome to see all that support. All right. Yeah, it doesn't seem like you have any more questions. Uh, do you ever use AQ, AQL? What is AQL? <laughs> I've never heard about that. Acceptable quality limit. That doesn't sound like a thing. What is AQL? Acceptable, acceptable quality limits. Force tolerate. Is that uh, Adreno DB? Uh, bleh. Or Deno DB. This is the first time hearing about it. Uh, Areno DB. <laughs> uh, which which one is it? It doesn't seem to. Uh, Adreno query language. Okay. Uh, are you sure you're spelling this correct? Because Google doesn't find anything. Is it Arduino query language? It also doesn't seem to be a thing. What is this? Okay, uh, you know what? Uh, feel free to join the Discord server and ask me there, we'll be more than happy. I mean, you're already in our Discord server, so just ask me there because I don't know what is that. I don't wanna spend half an hour trying to find the correct <laughs> spelling of that. So let's just, let's just wrap it, the ArangoDB. Okay, that sounds familiar. <laughs> but uh, let's just talk about this in Discord. So once again, thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for your support. Join our Discord server. Let's chat about stuff in there. And uh, yeah, have a nice uh, rest of the weekend or nice rest of the week if you're watching this on YouTube. As usual, you can find all the mentioned links in the description to the channel video or wherever you're watching this. Thank you for watching and I see you next time. Bye.